Hi, welcome back to video number 10 in Data Science Dojo's Introduction to Text Analytics with R. I am your host, Dave Langer. Per our process, what we have here is a RStudio environment with all the code executed through the end of video 9. And where we ended up in video at the end of video 9 was the situation as embodied by this plot. So we built ourselves a mighty random forest. And in particular, what we did is we built a mighty random forest with not only our textual features that we had processed extensively, but also we added in a feature that we engineered earlier in the video series for text length. We said, okay, look, can we improve our model over just the textual representations that we've created by adding this text length feature in, into the mix? And the answer was yes. Adding text length not only improved our accuracy overall, it also uplifted both our sensitivity and our specificity. And as we talked about in video number nine, there are many metrics that we can use to gauge how effective our model is. Accuracy is one, but we can also drill in and have more detailed type of metrics. And in this case, we talked about sensitivity being essentially the metric that says how well are, how good is your model, how effective is your model at predicting ham messages correctly. And then specificity was the metric that tells you how good your model is, how effective your model is at predicting spam messages. And what we saw is that text length not only increased our overall accuracy for our model, but it also increased sensitivity and specificity at the same time. And we said, that's great. While not, while not necessarily a guarantee, it is, it is indicative that maybe text length is a very powerful feature that will be universal. And the idea, the hypothesis being, for example, in general, spam messages will always be longer than ham messages. Therefore, it may be a universal feature that will always be predictive over time and space. No guarantee of that, of course, but it is, it is, it is indicative when it raises both sensitivity and specificity at the same time. Okay. We also postulated at the end of the of last video that we could engineer another feature, potentially, and add it to the mix and see if we could get even more improvement. And what we mentioned was we could use cosine similarity as the basis of that feature. So before we actually get into the code to actually check that out, we should probably talk about what cosine similarity is. Not surprisingly, I have some slides to discuss the concept. Okay, so we've talked about similarity in vector space in a previous video where we talked about specifically about uh, the dot product, how you can use the dot product between two vectors as a proxy for correlation, the proxy for similarity. Specifically, the dot product between two vectors that seem to be closer in vector space will be higher than the dot product between two vectors that are further away in vector space. And as you recall, we had a vector space, a hypothetical example of vector space that looks like this. I won't reproduce the document term frequency table, the hypothetical table that we use to draw this diagram because it's not necessarily germane to this conversation. Go back to video, go back into the previous video if you're interested in more detail on that. But what we have here essentially is a hypothetical vector space consisting of two dimensions. All of our documents either have foo or bar in them. And consequently, we can map our vector representations based on their foo-ness and their barness in this vector space model. And what we saw was doc one is the green line here and doc two was this red line. And we could see that, well, they're not very close together. Right? Doc two seems to have a lot more barness than foo-ness and doc one has more foo-ness than barness. And therefore they weren't, they didn't seem to be too much alike. And we confirmed that in fact, based on the dot product between the two, they're in fact not, you know, there's, they're not necessarily highly correlated. But we promised in that video that actually there would be a better way for us to actually understand the similarity between two document vectors in the vector space model than just using the dot product. And we said specifically that would be the cosine similarity. So if we think about this, Rather than just using the dot product between two vectors, if we actually say, look, I can actually measure the angle between these two vectors, maybe I can use a metric there that's actually more powerful than just the dot product. And specifically, we can. We can use the cosine function. As we'll talk about in a bit, there are some particular advantages to using cosine versus some other trigonometric function like sine or tangent, that sort of thing. 
And now if we pretend that the angle between doc one and doc two has been labeled theta, we can essentially say, look, we can measure the similarity between doc one and doc two in vector space given the cosine of theta, the cosine of the angle between these two documents. Now, as you recall from the previous video, we also had the example of doc three represented here in blue. If we say the angle between doc one and doc three is alpha, we could also measure the similarity between doc one and doc three using co the cosine value of alpha. And then we can then compare cosine alpha versus cosine theta and actually get a more definitive understanding of which, do which document vectors are more alike than others. And not surprisingly, what we'll find is that doc one and doc three have a higher cosine value than doc one and doc two do. But let's go in a little, just go in a little bit deeper on cosine, right? So why exactly is cosine an improvement? I'm stating here on the slide that cosine is an improvement over using the dot product. So let's, let's, let's talk about why. So some advantages of using the cosine for document similarity are, one, given our representations here, the cosine will be between zero and one, which is nice. Whereas before we saw that dot products could be any sort of particular, you know, there could be some arbitrary number, 136, 212, 95, you don't know. All you could talk about was the relative, uh, the relative magnitude of the numbers and not necessarily get anything more definitive. But given our representations, the way we represent our vectors in vector space, we will get a cosine value between zero and one, which is nice because we know that a one essentially means perfect similarity. So a cosine of one would essentially mean the document vectors are exactly the same. They have, basically, they have exactly the same number of words. And then and if we're using bigrams and trigrams, they have them in the same exact order, so on and so forth. So you would essentially see two lines on your graph overlapping in the case of a, a cosine similarity of one. Zero would be essentially 90 degree angle. They're completely orthogonal. And in our particular case here, using our, hyper, our particular vector space model here, Essentially, you would have, the only way you could have a cosine of zero is, is doc one would only be foo. It had only foo in it. And doc two, for example, would only have bar in it. Then they would be orthogonal, right? They'd be at right angles. So therefore, cosine would be zero in that case. Okay. Now, this is, this, is, this is true also to a certain extent with dot product, but just go with me here for a second, is that cosine similarity is also very, very nice because it works well in high dimensional spaces. And as we've talked about before, and as we saw earlier when we just added bigrams to our data frame, text analytics is, is a high dimensional problem, right? It suffers from the curse of dimensionality big time. It's not uncommon for you to have tens of thousands of features, 100,000 features, 200,000 features. It all depends upon the size of your corpora, right? How, how many documents do you have in each of your corpuses that you're looking at? Or... It's also a function of how big the individual documents are. Or in the worst case, you have a very large corpus, many documents, and the documents happen to be big. For example, imagine doing text analytics over every science fiction novel published in the United States in the 20th century. That would, your, your data frame would be gargantuan. Good news is that cosine works very, very well, even in high dimensional spaces. Now, of course, you'd probably SVD that to shrink it down, but you get the idea. So cosine is really, really nice. So let's talk a little bit about the mathematics then. Okay, so how do you calculate the cosine similarity? So here's the mathematics for it. So the cosine of theta, which is the, the angle between vector A and vector B, is essentially the dot product of A and B divided by the length of A times the length of B. Or alternatively, you can think of it in this mathematical formulation. We, we saw this previously, right? This right here. Take the first part of A times the first part of B plus the second part of A times the second part of B plus the third part of A times the third part of B, so on and so forth. That's your numerator, the dot product. Now notice below, what you've got here essentially is a stylized representation of the Pythagorean theorem. Turns out the Pythagorean theorem is wildly useful. Who knew, right? If you remember, the Pythagorean theorem says c squared equals a squared plus b squared, essentially, right? Well, all right, fine, fair enough. But it, tends, it turns out that the Pythagorean theorem actually works well in high dimensional space in addition to low dimensional space. 
So for example, the Pythagorean theorem scales. So, you know, if you have three dimensional space, you just have three terms, your n will be three. If you have 37,000 dimensions, the n will be 37,000, so on and so forth, but it still holds. So this essentially gives you the length of the vector. This gives you the length of the vector. You just multiply them together. So given the document term frequency matrix here, which we saw from the, in the previous video, we can actually do some calculations. So the cosine similarity of doc one and doc two, not surprisingly, is six times 10, 10 times three, that's your numerator, and then six squared plus 10 squared, six squared plus 10 squared, times 10 squared plus three squared, which gives you 60 plus 30, so on and so forth. And then over here you get 0 0.73911963. That's the similarity between doc one and doc two. Notice how the math actually is relatively simple here. It's because we're only dealing with two dimensions. Now, obviously, if this was a 300 dimension table, right, like we did, as you saw when we SVD, we SVD down to 300 columns, you know, this calculation gets pretty hairy. It's not difficult, it's just, it's just big, right? So it's prone for error by doing it by hand. Lucky for us, we can stand on the shoulders of giants and use our libraries to calculate it, but it's still worthwhile to know how the calculations are actually done. Okay. Not surprisingly, we can also do the cosine similarity between doc one and doc three. And I won't drain the math, you can easily plug and chug, but here's the thing that you want to take a look at. This matches our intuition. Notice that the cosine similarity between doc one and doc three is 0 0.9518606. It's quite a bit higher, almost, you know, what, about 21 point something higher than this. That's good. That's good. Now, here's the thing. Do not interpret this as a percentage. This doesn't say that doc one and doc two are 74% similar. It's not, you can't, you can't think of it that way. You can't think that doc one and doc three are 95% similar. You can't think of it that way. How you can think of this though is in terms of relative similarity. This is substantially more uh, relevant, or excuse me, substantially more similar, sorry, substantially more similar than this is. It's about it's about 22% more similar than this is. Not, that, not in absolute terms, right? You can think of these in terms of the differences because it's on a scale from zero to one. This one is about 21% higher than this one on that scale. Notice that I'm comparing these two values. I'm not comparing the docs themselves, just these two values. That is, that's logical and, and, and okay to do. Just remember, this doesn't mean 74%, this doesn't mean 95% similarity between the documents. But you can compare these two numbers to each other and say this one is about 21% higher than that one. That is okay. Okay, cosine similarity. Excellent. So let's go ahead and go back to R and actually see some code. Okay, so we're back in R. Let's go ahead and close this plot down. Let's go ahead and move on. So we can do cosine similarity calculations using any number of libraries in R. I've chosen to use LSA. That's just a choice that I did. Quantita can also calculate it, but for the purposes of this video, LSA works pretty well. So go ahead and load up the library, and if we run the help file on the cosine function, we get cosine measure of matrices. Okay, cool. But what's really, what's really germane is this right here. Calculates the cosine measures between two vectors or between all column vectors of a matrix. So what that means is, in the context of our PowerPoint slides that we just saw, I could use the cosine function here from the LSA package to calculate the cosine between doc1 and doc2, doc1 and doc3, and then doc2 and doc3. I can do that one by one. Or alternatively, I can just create a matrix. And if, make, if I make the columns of my matrix, my individual documents, I can ask the cosine function from the LSA package just to calculate all the similarity scores all at once, which is nice because it means I write less code and I just let the computer run and plug and chug and calculate everything for me, so which is nice. So as a consequence, we need to unpack this code so you can understand what's going on. So first up, let's take a look at train.svd and if we do a quick dim on train.svd, as a reminder, you can see here that I have 3,901 rows, each one of those is my training documents, in 302 columns. And if you recall, 
The reason why we have 302 columns is because we took the 300 features that we pulled from our LSA, from our SVD, and then we added the label at the front. We made the first column the labels, hammer spam, and then the 302nd column ends up being the text length, which we just added as part of our last Mighty Random Forest. So what we need essentially is everything but those two bookends. We don't need the label because obviously we're not gonna be calculating cosine similarity on the label. And also we're not gonna be calculating cosine similarity on the text length. That makes no sense because that's a feature that's totally outside of our vector space representation. So this code says, okay, R, go to this data frame filter it, and specifically I want you to get rid of the first column and also the last column. Because if I highlight this code right here and run it real quick, you'll notice it'll spit out 302, which is the last column. So get rid of the first column and the last column. And you know that because I got a minus sign here. Okay, cool. So that whittles down my data frame to just the 300 vector space col um, columns of features, okay, feature data. I then transform this into a matrix because cosine will not work on data frames. So this basically is, a, I cast it, I transform from a data frame to a matrix, and then I transpose it. Because remember, cosine's, the cosine function only works on column vectors, so I need to flip my matrix, because right now it's in a document term frequency format, but I can then flip it to be a term frequency document. And then my documents will now be the columns and then I can calculate the cosine on it. So I'm using the transpose there to get to my documents to be the column vectors. I run cosine on it. And basically it gives me a nice large matrix, 3,901 by 3,901 3, with all the cosine similarities being populated between all the documents, which is nice. Now this code will take a number of minutes to run. So I've already ran it. So if you do dim on train dot similarities, there you go. I've got 3,901 rows, 3,901 columns, and each individual cell is essentially an intersection of one document and another, and what's their cosine similarity? Sweet. So now I can get, I can start using that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to engineer a feature. And here's my hypothesis behind this feature. If I pull out all of the spam messages. If I find out, if I find out in my training data what are all of the rows, all of the document rows that are spam messages, I can then say, look, you know what? I have a hypothesis that says, on average, spam message, any given spam message is going to have a higher average cosine similarity with all of the spam messages than Ham would. That's going to be the hypothesis. Right? This idea that's saying, look, spam messages should always have a higher cosine similarity with other spam messages than ham should with a spam message. Right? This, this, this is a core assumption we're making, that we can differentiate between ham and spam based on our vector space model, right? the way we represent our documents as vectors. So it stands to reason that the cosine similarity between, on average, the cosine similarity between spam messages is going to be higher than on average the cosine similarity between a ham message and a spam message. So we can actually build a feature to actually uh, calculate that on a per document basis. Hey, for each document in our, in our, in our corpus, for each 3,901 documents, what is the average cosine similarity between that document and all of the spam messages in the training data? And in general, we would expect that spam messages would have a higher cosine similarity than ham. And then that way we can maybe feed that into a model and it'll improve the performance. Okay, so first thing we can do here is we can run this line of code, which essentially says, look, give me the indexes of all of the spam messages. Go through all of the labels, tell me which ones are spam. Just give me the numbers. So if I run this line of code, you can see down here, I will have now I have spam indexes and there are 523 indexes. So out of the 3,901 training documents, 523 are spam and four, five, six, eight, 11, 14, so on and so forth are the row indexes for the spam messages. Okay, cool. 
So next up, I'm going to go ahead and just use a, a good old fashioned for loop. It's not particularly, it's not considered best our practices to use a for loop, but I think it's relatively intuitive. So I'm just, just going to go ahead and use a for loop. But to be able to store these values in the location, I need to pre allocate a new column on my data frame. So I say R, go to the train.svd data frame, access it, and create a new column called spam similarity on it. And then I want you to fill it with zeros. Fill it with zeros. So I run this line of code. And if I pull train.svd up in the spreadsheet view, actually that's not going to work because it's too too wide. But if you imagine, if you will, if you scrolled all the way over to the right, you would see a new column here called uh, spam similarity and it would be filled with zeros. Filled with zeros. Okay. Now that I've got a placeholder, now if I got a, now that I have a storage location in my data frame to, to store these spam similarities, I can just go through row by row. So this code says, hey, R, just iterate. Take this variable I, make it one, all the way through N rows. And once again, if you run this code, N rows gives you 3,901. So do make I the value of one, make it the value of two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, all the way up to a value of 3,901. Just iterate over this, this data frame. Okay, and here's what I want you to do. Overwrite each location of spam similarity. The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, all the way up to the 3,901st one, and overwrite them each in turn with this value, which essentially is the mean. Calculate the average of the similarities where the row in question is my current document, and then the columns are just the spam indexes. Now think about this for a second. Remember, our similarity matrix is 3,901 rows and 3,901 columns, which essentially means I can think of this as a two-dimensional representation of all my documents. So on the horizontal, I'm saying, hey, deal with the first row, deal with the second row, deal with the third row. But I want you to grab all of the similarities from the columns for just those documents that are spam. So this will say, look, here is for row number one, here is all of the cosine similarities for this with the spam messages. For row number two, these are all the cosine similarities for all the spam messages. For row 335, these are all the cosine similarities for the spam messages. And just average them up. Sweet, right? Just give me the average. So if I run this, run this code, it'll give me a nice new feature populated with all this goodness. Now, not surprisingly, we could go look at them. We could go, we could, I could, I could whittle the data down and pull it up in the spreadsheet view. But it's actually better to visualize what's going on with the feature. That that's we teach this day one in the boot camp at Data Science Dojo. We teach all of our students this: visualize, visualize, visualize. Super super easy way for you to understand what's going on in your data, especially in the features that you engineer. So we're going to go use the ggplot2, uh, the mighty ggplot2, to actually create a histogram to actually show how this feature works. In particular, we're going to do spam similarity along the x-axis. We're going to use the label to fill it. And what, we're going, what we want to see is how well do, do these, does this new feature differentiate ham from spam? So we can just go ahead and run all this code. And there you go. Voila. Now this is super awesome. Super awesome. Look at this. So along the x-axis here, this is the mean spam message cosine similarity. So on a per message basis, what is the average cosine similarity between that message and all the other spam messages that we have? And notice all the orange in ham is orange. Notice all the orange down here, only a little bit of spam. And notice spam. So this, 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 this plot, this plot is indicative of our hypothesis maybe having some merit, where we said, look, our hypothesis is in general, spam messages should have higher cos should have higher cosine similarity on average with other spam messages than they do with ham. And the opposite should also be true. That in, on average, 
ham messages should have lower cosine similarity with spam messages. And this, this plot seems to indicate that. This plot seems to indicate that. So this is pretty exciting, right? This is indicative of maybe this is a pretty powerful feature. But as always, though, we just can't rely on the data per se or the visualization of the data per se. We have to actually run it through a model and test it out. So not surprisingly, once again, we're going to use our same process here. We're going to use tenfold cross-validation, repeated three times. We're going to build a mighty random forest each time with 500 trees. We're going to ask Carrot to try seven different values for M try, M try being the number of random variables each tree gets to use as it builds itself to find out which of those seven values of M try is actually the best. And then Carrot will find that model for you, build it with all the remaining training data and return it back to you. Okay. Now, as usual, this will take a while to run, so I've commented it out. And if you get the binaries from the GitHub, there'll be one called rf.cv.3.rdata. That's essentially the cached uh, binary version of this run, which, is, which allows you just to load it up and take a look at it. So let's load it up, run the results. And as you can see here, these numbers look pretty high. Notice that mtry is 52. Now, if you remember, our first mighty random forest mtry value was 151. Then it came down to 101 when we added text length, and now we're at 52 when we added our second feature of spam similarity, which is pretty interesting. Notice that our accuracy is going up, and the number of trees that we need, excuse me, the number of features, excuse me, the number of random features that we need for each tree is going down. It's a strong signal. It's not definitive, but it's a strong signal. But as we learned last time, this is not enough. Let's take a look at the confusion matrix so we can actually drill down on this. Okay. So what do we got going on here? Okay. So our accuracy went up. Our accuracy went up to 97.9%, which is great. This is sweet. But what's more important is to go down in the sensitivity and specificity to actually know what, what's going on. And here's, here's the kicker. Our overall accuracy went up, but notice that our specificity actually went down vis-a-vis -vis our previous random forest model. The specificity was over, was almost nearly, it was nearly 100% in the previous model. And now it's down to 97.22%, but notice that we got quite a jump or a more than 1% jump in sensitivity. So what this means is we the model has degraded in terms of being able to correctly identify spam. This, numbers, this number here in the confusion matrix has gone up, but this number has dropped quite a bit. If you recall, this was 100 in the last model. Now it's 69. And as we talked about before in our hypothetical business scenario, this is good because we're, we're, we're operating under the assumption that our customers are going to be more forgiving of an occasional spam message coming through erroneously than they are us taking a legitimate message and putting it in a spam folder, for example. So this is great. So what this shows is that maybe we found a feature that we can put together with our text length feature and then the rest of our 300 SVD features and get a pretty awesome model, 97.9% accurate. Okay, so that's pretty exciting. So we'll go ahead and stop the video there. Well, actually, you know what? Let's not do that. Let's 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 take a look at one more thing here before we before we stop. And let's take a look at the the importance plot. Okay, so check this out. Check this out. Now, if you remember on the previous plot, text length was way over here, and then x twenty four was way over here. Notice how spam similarity now dwarfs even text length and really scrunches up all of our text features. So what this is telling you is that spam similarity is a super, super powerful feature. Now, there's one thing we should probably mention. This, 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 is, this is super exciting, but it also should be sending your data scientist spidey sense into overdrive because this may be indicative of overfitting. This may be indicative of overfitting. Remember, we said earlier that text length was a good feature because it raised both sensitivity and specificity at the same time. 
Notice that, in fact, spam similarity did not do that. It reduced specificity and increased sensitivity, which is okay from a business perspective. But when this is com when it's combined with this dwarfing thing, how it becomes so much more important than everything else, this should send your spidey sense in overdrive saying, mm, okay, I'm going to be a little skeptical. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that this feature is going to be awesome, but it may be overfitting. It may overfit. So we'll need to test that. So we will end the video here because this is a good place to pause and say, okay, look, next time we'll actually start working with our test data. We'll get it transformed into our vector space that we need it to be in and actually start running our test to actually say, look, you know what, is this model, is this mighty random forest with all of these features as awesome as we think it is now on our test data? And then we'll be able to verify a couple things. One is, is our model awesome? And then two, uh, is, is this spam similarity feature awesome or is it overfitting? So you'll just have to wait until next time to find out the answer to that. Okay, so if you have any questions or concerns, please, please, please use the page for this video. We at Data Science Dojo monitor our YouTube channel often and try to answer any and all questions promptly. Also, if you like these tutorials, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll be producing content on a weekly basis and then that way you can keep abreast of our latest tutorials. More generally, if you like what we do at Data Science Dojo, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the social media channels where we provide our, our subscribers with a font of curated data science goodness. And lastly, I hope to see you in an upcoming Data Science Dojo bootcamp. This is Dave Langer signing off and wishing you very happy data sleuthing.